I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker, John Warren. During this session, John will be talking about his personal journey and how creating happiness should be every caregiver's number one goal. John, the floor is yours. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, please let me know if my audio is good, if it's too loud, if it's too quiet. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate everyone having me. Um, uh, early childhood intervention is uh, something that's pretty important to uh, me, to my family. Um, you may recognize the, the last name Warren as part of the Warren Center. That's not a coincidence. Um, I am, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Uh, Did that work? Okay, I think that worked. Uh, I am, uh, I'm John Warren. I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas with my wife, um, with my wife, Anne, and my two dogs. Um, my parents, Bill and Bev, they live in the Dallas area. Uh, I work for Fanbyte Media, which is a big media corporation that's based in Los Angeles. Uh, I run the media division uh, remotely and I manage a team of roughly 55 people. Um, and I was an ECI uh, as a child, so I want to go through my life. I've never, <laughs> I've never done a presentation of my life before, so this is a little strange, uh, but it should be fun. Um, <laughs> so let's get started. Uh, you should know that I, I picked this very cool background uh, on here. It's it's moving. Um, I really broke out the big guns for this presentation, so I uh, hope everyone feels honored. Um, but let's. Uh, let me not, let's do this. Okay, uh, so I want to talk about my life at a glance, uh, full of very, I think, normal milestones. I, I went to school, uh, I went to college, I got married, I got a post postgraduate degree, uh, I started a business and ran it into the ground, uh, I got divorced, hey, disabled people can be divorced uh, as well, uh, I got married again, <laughs> and uh, now I'm running another successful business. Um, so these are milestones that are pretty normal, I would say. Um, I'm going to say normal a lot <laughs> uh, for various reasons, and we'll get to that. Uh, but I want to go way back before any of this stuff uh, happened uh, in my life. All these very normal things happened. Um, and I want to go to the day I was born. Uh, so if, in case you were wondering if I was all, always this cute, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> I think in this second picture on the right, uh, my dad is trying to get me to eat or something. And mom's probably trying to take a picture of me. And I'm like, dad, <laughs> I'm, I'm posing, please let me finish. Um, but anyway, I was born on July 1st, 1985. I just turned 36. I feel every single minute of that 36, uh, I was born in Amarillo, Texas. This. Um, when I was born, uh, I had problems, okay? Um, <laughs> a lot of problems. Uh, when, when they pulled me out of the C-section, I was what was known as a floppy baby, which I just got to be a better PC term for that in the year 2021. But I was a floppy baby. I was a, a jello mold in an earthquake. And it was uh, uh, kind of a scary thing to see uh, as a parent, as a doctor, I'm sure. Um, I had low muscle tone, excuse me. Um, very low muscle tone, very low skeletal muscle movement. Um, I was jaundiced. I had respiratory issues that followed me into early childhood. And I had a grim initial prognosis. Um, I, you know, doctors really, um, they can see a situation sometimes, see things for what they fear it to be, make quick judgments about what the condition is. And uh, sometimes give parents not the maybe right tone of information uh, that they need. There's, I, I have huge respect for doctors in the field, uh, but it is you know sometimes uh, an issue of uh, uh, of confidence and optimism and, and things like that. So my parents got a second opinion from another doctor, um, and that doctor was more optimistic. Saw things in my development early on that seemed to indicate that there were you know, obvious signs of life, as you can, I'm sure, see in the face of your own child, if you're here uh, to listen to, to, to folks with their own kids, maybe you have your own kids that are going through these issues, you kind of know what I'm talking about, you just kind of see, this is your kid, this is someone who, um, you know, wants to live and be happy. Um, and so after that grim initial prognosis, what followed was a mystery diagnosis. And I'm sure folks here, uh, and the chat have also dealt with that as well. 
Um, a lot of mystery sometimes can follow some of these disabilities, these developmental, developmental delays, which can be really frustrating. Um, but, you know, we had some good advice from, from that second doctor. And also what was really behind me were my parents, Bill and Bev. Um, here's some things about them. They're hopeful people. They're compassionate people. They're attentive. They're accommodating. They are inquisitive. Uh, and they are stubborn, and they passed that one to me for sure. I think they passed the other ones to me as well, but they they certainly passed the stubbornness part. And they didn't really like they didn't like feeling like there was no no hope. And I feel like that's what parents need when they're dealt with uh, when they're when they're dealt with when they're dealing with a child with with certain delays and difficulties and disabilities. I think that's just what what the you know what everyone needs is a little bit of optimism and a little bit of hope. So that stubbornness led them to uh, talking to doctors, talking to other folks. They were uh, uh, eventually referred to the Warren Center, known as the Richardson Development Center at the time, founded in the late '60s in the Richardson, Texas area. Um, and it they really specialize. Warren Center specializes in early childhood intervention which combines a bunch of disciplinary approaches like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, providing resources to parents and families, and also support. And it's all rolled up into this program um, that benefits families and children alike. So I wanna walk through my experience as I remember it, and also sometimes as it was told to me, because again, this is when I was very young, but I did take a lot of lessons from these things and, and I'll talk about those as well. For physical therapy, you know, I had a lot of difficulty as a child with skeletal muscle developmental delays, gri gripping, sitting up straight, um, movement, you know, obviously everything from crawling to walking, all of those things were not really in the picture at an early stage. I wasn't developing those skills properly because um, of skeletal muscle tone issues. So physical therapy just strengthened those things. Uh, and consistently improve uh, little by little was really one of the, the first priorities and really the main priority because that was the overwhelming uh, disability that, that I had uh, and still have. Um, and it started a journey for me, uh, understanding physical therapy, understanding my body. Um, that's one of those things I think, you know, when you're a kid without disabilities, you, you develop these things very organically. You develop them, you run and jump and play, you develop these skills because you have the instinct to do them. And so you do them. Um, when you have d profound disabilities like skeletal muscle weakness, you don't have that. So your development is super different. And I remember kind of learning about the limitations of my body and things I could do and could not do. Um, you know, because of this physical therapy, and that was vital. I mean, we all kind of learn what our bodies can and can't do, I think, <laughs> very naturally, but sometimes that's not natural uh, for us. So these physical therapists were amazing at helping me develop that sense of self, actually. Um, and I think, you know, those first milestones really helped develop an independence that uh, that had to be, you know, that, that really had to be there for me to develop other skills. Um, and, uh, you know, sitting up straight, sitting up without, you know, a, a lot of support, these things, you know, rolling over in bed, sitting up in bed, these were things that physical therapists helped me a lot with and made uh, living at home away from doctors or therapists or anything like that, uh, most likely a, a much less stressful experience uh, for, for my parents and probably myself. Um, and my very specific issues, you know, every child is different. They have different weaknesses. They have different disabilities, um, gaps in their motor skills, things like that. You know, my specific issues were uh, tackled head on. You know, a lot of uh, digit, you know, digit movement things were, were really uh, an early focus for me is, it's really difficult to, to grip things properly because I had a lot of weakness in my hands. So that was one of my specific issues that I had to overcome. And of course, there's occupational therapy, you know, that focuses more on um, specific tasks. It focuses more on, well, how do you get dressed? Um, how do you brush your teeth? How do you um, feed yourself? Uh, these were things that were connected to physical therapy in a way because I would have to develop the upper upper arm strength to put on a shirt 
I still don't put on a shirt like you do probably. Um, it looks a little weird, but it works for me. Um, and I think that occupational therapy actually develops critical thinking in children because it allows them to kind of improvise, develop a set of skills that no matter how silly or how no, no, no matter how many steps it takes, it doesn't matter. A child wants to work on these things and figure these things out because you know, we're all naturally inquisitive, I think, as kids. And so occupational therapy helped provide those specific skill-based tasks. And to be honest, it probably gave my parents a break. Okay. Okay. Now he kind of feed himself. Great. Like let's, let's hang out and just talk and, and not have to worry about a lot of the minutia of me getting dressed in the morning. Like these were things that I would develop and just become more independent. Not only was that good for my own mental health growing up, but I think it's good for, um, for parental stuff too. But these milestones happen differently for all different families. And sometimes these, these steps may be very small and there are still things I need help with even as an adult. So and I'll talk about a little, I'll talk a little bit about milestones in a, in a while, um, but I also needed help with speech therapy. I was a talker. I was at a young age, I talked a lot. Um, that's something my, my, my parents uh, has, have told me that a lot. I was a, a big talker. I uh, still am. Uh, did not lose that as an adult. Uh, but I did need to learn how to say some consonants and vowels and conjunction. Uh, I had speech therapy at the Warren Center, but I also continued speech therapy through early years in elementary school. Um, I'm a professional podcaster now. So I, I guess I'm doing okay. Like there's, 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 there's still things I get hung up on, but most of it is uh, pronouncing bizarre names, stuff that we all, we all have issues with. So, um, and uh, yeah, it did help me develop communication skills. Um, one of the things that the Warren Center taught as a young age, kind of, I believe as a rule to many children were fundamentals of ASL, of sign language, of being able to communicate things non-verbally in order to get you know, to, to have your needs met. And when, when children have difficulty developing verbal skills, that is often very frustrating, not only for folks around them who may not know what the child wants, but for the child, it, it, for the child themselves, who is trying to communicate something that is not, um, that is not being communicated. And it can be very frustrating, it can be very lonely, frankly. And I think teaching fundamentals of ASL, teaching fundamentals of just a very rudimentary, you know, sign language to between the parent and child. It helped us in those early stages and also helped me latch on to, frankly, ways to communicate with folks well into my, well into my adult years of having more patience and, and not being frustrated with communication because communication as fundamental and natural as it is to maybe many of us, um, it is still very frustrating and isolating for folks that have difficulties communicating. So, ECI really helped me develop that patience and also the, the, the toolkit to deal with a lot of those things. This was really fundamental for my parents, I feel like, resources. Um, I think it is a, I have to imagine it's a very lonely experience not knowing what resources are out there for you as a parent, um, maybe scary. Um, and I think the Warren Center did a great job of uh, you know, referring us to doctors that, you know, could see my condition for what it was and, and not what they feared it to be or what it wasn't. Um, a lot of uh, resources for post ECI therapies, which I took great advantage of. Um, maybe medical supply contacts in terms of you need an orthopedic fit for, you know, a brace or, or something like that, or wheelchair or whatever is needed. Um, things for the home to help with feeding. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot more, uh, even resources for like enrolling your child in school, uh, because that, you know, that might feel very far away to you as a parent with a, a child with disabilities of, okay, well, do I put my child in a, a normal public school? Like, you know, what do I do? And, and the Warren Center and other ECI programs can really help with those decisions. And also support. I, I don't know if this is the most important thing, but I think it's probably very important psychologically. I think ECI programs are typically full of professionals who, who get it, who get all of these, the psychological aspect of uh, having a disability or being a parent of a child with a disability. I think being understood um, is a relief, right? I think 
you being understood and having these frustrations and maybe the sadness, but also this, this pure optimism about your child and your child's future is met with affirmation, you know? And I think that's a really, really powerful thing that an ECI program can provide. Um, and also perseverance when you're running on empty. I, I would like to be real. I'm a big proponent of being real. I don't like to hide emotion and, and bury it. I like to acknowledge that I think as parents, I think there, you, there probably is frustration and maybe a, a loss of a feeling of a, a grip on the situation or, or overwhelmed with worry. I mean, I think these are things that are normal for parents to feel. And I think the support system of an ECI program uh, and folks around it can really help you uh, carry on when, when things are really tough and things do get tough. Um, so I wanna talk about things that I, I pulled into adulthood from the ECI program, excuse me. Um, and I wanna start by saying, I think success is subjective. I think, you know, when, when I was first asked um, to do this keynote, you know, and there, there was kind of a spin on, okay, well, I've done so many cool things as an adult. I, I manage this large company and have a lot of employees, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's not everyone's trajectory, right? I think everyone's trajectory is different. Your dreams are different. Your child's dreams are different. And also the ceilings of what your child can accomplish or, or do or whatever are, are based on their condition and kind of the ceilings that are created. And I don't want to act like those ceilings aren't there. Um, as much as I'd like to be free safety for the Dallas Cowboys, and I might be an upgrade right now, frankly, for that position. Um, I know that like my success is not defined by getting to that place because I've used the skills that I developed in ECI and beyond to build a life for myself that I'm very happy with. And I think I've determined that success is really much more attached to happiness and comfort and having, I think, a, a relatively psychologically easy life. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll temper that in a bit. It's not easy, but it is easy in a, in, a, in a grand sense of being surrounded by support and, and kind of developing the skill set that works for me and that works for your child and that works for your family. Um, it's different for everyone. So as I talk about things that I've taken to adulthood, um, into adulthood, I, I do want to stress that I think everyone's situation is very different. Um, and it's really tough to uh, try to give any sort of one size fits all advice to parents and children. Um, because as anyone in an ECI program can tell you, everyone's situation is very different. Um, but that said, I think just independence uh, and happiness are things that I really define as success. And I think ECI can kind of kickstart a lot of those conversations. You know, how do you and your child define independence and happiness? I think independence is, has a little more to do with like the skill sets you develop, but happiness has everything to do with the attitude and the optimism and the love that you can still provide your child through this process of, of this kind of early childhood intervention process of therapies and, and developing skills, which can be a very difficult thing. Um, and what is the balance, right? You know, do you, do you push super hard for your kid to meet certain milestones, um, you know, uh, past all sorts of comfort, or are you are you actually happy with this wonderful little life you could have, even though, you know, there, there could be limitations that your child has? I, I think that's also something that I've wrestled with a lot. I think as an adult of wondering, well, what could my independence level be if I had stayed with physical therapy, not only through my teens, but very, very, you know, strenuous physical therapy through my 20s and early 30s? And I, I kind of, I wonder about that sometimes and I think, well, but I might've missed out on some other things about having a uh, very independent away from home college life and meeting uh, my wives and, and having these jobs and, and having friends and going on vacations and things like that. And I think it's about finding a balance, um, but yeah, I think everyone's also different. So find that balance between kind of what is your, what are your independence goals, but is it coming at the expense of, of your happiness, of your familial happiness? And I think it comes in all shapes and sizes. I also think independence can be a game of inches, which I want to talk about. Um, this is very specific to me. I'm not a child psychologist, um, but I, I, I've said normal a lot. But to be honest, there's almost nothing normal about my life. Um, 
I, I have a wheelchair that requires a ton of maintenance all the time. I, um, I walk around my house with a cane. I have a, a super expensive uh, ramp van that should not cost as much as it does. Like my life is not normal. It is, it is difficult. It is strange. It takes me longer to cook things. It takes me longer to, to do most everything. Um, social gatherings are still weird because I still talk it butt level with everyone because no one seems to realize they should get down on my level and talk to me face to face like there's nothing normal about being disabled there's just not and I think like I would just say goodbye to that idea of I hear a lot in media it's like I just want my child to have a normal life and I understand I understand what people mean by that but there is a level of normalcy that's just gone and I think ECI actually helped address that of like you are going to be doing things differently, but there's nothing wrong with any of that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with putting on a shirt with one arm and then one and then in your head and then your other arm while you're bent over a, a chair in order to get enough leverage to pull a shirt over your head. It doesn't matter. It's not normal, but it doesn't matter. Um, and I think there's beauty in the differences that we all have, right? So I think really establishing that with your child of, hey, it doesn't matter that you need two hands to feed yourself or that you need help sitting up or, or what. It doesn't matter. These things, it doesn't matter if you're normal. It just matters that you're happy, right? And and I think that's something I, I still feel very strongly about. So if you're ever worried about giving your child a normal life, I'd throw that out the window because I think it is it is such a different it's such a it's such a game changer being born with a disability or developing disabilities, um, and I I think being uh, you know dishonest about that is a little de defeating defeating the purpose a little bit. Um, so I love not being normal. I really do. I've I've really gotten used to it, and I want to go back to this for a second. Normal milestones, right? For for most folks, but this is what it really looked like. I mean, it looked like seven surgeries. I was only diagnosed when I was nineteen. Um, I, and that was, by the way, a differential diagnosis, not really a, a totally firm one. Um, ankle surgery to correct another surgery around the time I was doing grad school. Um, a hip replacement in the middle of running a business. I, I had, and this, this year even, there was genetic confirmation and more information about mini core disease, which is the disease that I have. Um, that was given to me by a doctor in UCLA when I lived out in Los Angeles. So this is a process. I think having every one of your questions answered during the early childhood stage um, is a luxury. I think it's very difficult to have everything figured out at that early stage, but ECI can certainly help you along the path of figuring these things out. I think my case was actually very strange in a lot of ways. It's a rare disease, um, but, but I think you know a lot of these things ring true uh, for a lot of folks. This is one thing that UCI taught me, maybe more importantly than anything else, you know, small victories are to be savored because I think setbacks are common. Um, setbacks are a part of this process. Setbacks are a part of life, right? But sometimes when you have disabilities, those setbacks can feel very major, can feel very large um, because you kind of lose a sense of where things were and you feel like you'll never get them back. And I don't want to say that, you know, depending on the disability or the disease, um, sometimes that is unfortunately the case, but that doesn't mean that you can't make small victories um, as you develop a lot of your skills. Um, I think, you know, victories, these little milestones should be celebrated, should be, um, should be really held in high esteem of, you know, oh, you did one more rep, you did one more uh, bicep curl, you did one more leg lift, you walked two more feet. Um, these are things that I think ought to be celebrated because when there are setbacks as in an early childhood setting, um, it, it's really important to celebrate those moments where things kind of break through. And on the whole, I think that, you know, that creates and stimulates a, a situation of happiness. Um, and I think you need to frame realistic goals. Um, I think, you know, shooting for the moon is, is wonderful. And I don't think that should stop anybody but set up milestones, you know, along the way that are small. Um, and I think ECI does a good job of, of doing that. Okay, you can, 
you can feed yourself, um, you know, all three meals of the day. Like that is a huge milestone for a lot of children, um, even though it feels so normal, quote unquote, for, for so many other people. Um, this has led me as an adult, and I, I really attribute this a lot to these early days, um, even as a young child. Um, I, it's easy to celebrate others to me now, you know, even folks that don't have disabilities. Uh, it is really easy for me to see milestones that they, um, that they accomplish and celebrate them. They may not think it's a big deal, but you know, you know, because you and your child, your child has dealt with these things. And you can see that even small victories are hugely meaningful. Um, and I think leading by example, I mean, this is helping me with leadership of understanding that when people beat themselves up over, you know, not hitting some sort of self expectation, they can really go into themselves. And I think kids do that too. We feel uh, ashamed if we can't do something. We, you know, we, we develop shame as a young age because we can't do something we see other people being able to do. The ECI programs and, and supportive parents can really teach kids that have these developmental delays that that's, that's, you know, that's not right. You know, people, um, people develop and they, they succeed in different ways and, and those things should be celebrated. Um, I don't think optimism and realism are, are enemies. Uh, in fact, I think they, they often go hand in hand. I think setting a plan with an ECI professional and, and having goals and, and hitting those, all you can do is surpass those expectations. Um, but never, ever, ever mistake having a realistic goal for not being optimistic and, and rah, rah, and a cheerleader for your child and for this process, because I think that psychological aspect of it is something kids latch on to very, very early on. Um, and, you know, I think the stars are in reach. It's kind of corny. They just may not look like you as a parent imagine for your child, but that's okay. You know, um, they may not have wanted to grow up and do the thing you wanted them to do anyway. You know, <laughs> um, and here's, here's the other thing. This is, I'm kind of ending on a touchy feely note, but you know, my, my parents really taught me kind of how to love myself. And I think that was really bolstered by professionals in the ECI setting. And, and I showed that love to others and, and they gave that love back to me. And, and I think that has created the cycle, you know, when you really find ECI professionals that can help your child develop these skills, um, I, you know, you watch videos of the Warren Center dealing, you know, working with these kids and stuff, and it is nothing but, you know, good vibes and good energy. And even with those frustrating moments, there's a lot of love and support in those interactions. And as long as that's there, I think on a cosmic level, life can be pretty easy, even if a lot of those little moment to moment things are still difficult. And so I think if you really latch onto this as a concept of, you know, loving your child and also letting these ECI professionals love your child and kind of develop that, um, that, that skill set, you know, as, the, as a community unit, that's an unbelievably powerful thing as a kid, you know, especially you know, maybe this is your first rodeo, you have a first child that has a disability, you're feeling maybe a little bit hopeless about the situation. Like the folks at the Warren Center, I can tell you a million stories about kids that came from situations that felt very bleak and turned into just a, just a wonderful, loving, uh, communal development of skills and, and things that kids like to do that make them happy. You know, so that's, I think, really, really, really you know, a fundamental part of this early childhood stuff. Um, and I think early childhood development did, uh, intervention did help me on this path. Um, it helped me on a path of kind of understanding myself, understanding the world around me, understanding my parents, I think a bit, um, as I grow into adulthood and kind of understand, um, you know, what they were dealing with, with me as a, as a, a child with disabilities. Um, and it's, it's helped me develop a very, um, Take a hopeful view of the world um, when even when things are really difficult. So uh, that's kind of my story. That's kind of my experience with ECI. I uh, definitely want to thank uh, y'all for your um, your attention and time. Uh, we went about thirty minutes, so I'm, I'm super happy that we have some time for Q and A. Um, and I will check that in a moment. Uh, but thank you, thank you so much. So, John, I do want. I have one comment here um, that sure. I wanted to make sure you saw that. This is honestly so good to hear that, that we're on the right path. And thank you for speaking on this. Um, 
Right now I've got one question. Um, should an individual squat to be at your eye level when talking to you? So this is a this is this is one of those things that I think is very funny. I, I, I it, it is it's one of those things that when it happens to me, I really appreciate it. If people get down on my level, I'm not having to crane my neck. It's really nice. I wouldn't squat. Don't do that to your knees. If there's a chair, that's great. Um, but but I, I think it's one of those things that you know people don't understand. If you're craning your neck like this at a party at a setting creates a weird power dynamic, I feel like, between <laughs> between everyone around you. Um, and I think you get this with kids, too. If you want to get on a kid's level, you usually kind of meet them eye to eye. Um, I don't want to infantilize adult disabled folks. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I feel like, you know, I I, I think getting on eye level with, with, with anyone, I think, is a, a, a sign of uh, respect and acknowledgement. And it's, it's easy. When it's, when it's convenient, I would say, try to find a, a chair. Uh, don't, don't blow out your knees trying to squat down and talk to me. It's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, 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 uh, yeah, that's a good question though. So another question is, um, as parents, sometimes we, we have immense feeling of guilt or, or shame mm. or upsetness. And how do you think that may affect the child? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. I, I think uh, one, <laughs> um, I, I don't, I don't think there's anything to feel guilty about. Um, luck is a weird thing. Um, on this weird planet, <laughs> we a lot of us lucked into being born in the United States, and folks lucked into being born in. India, you know, we, we just, we can't make our own destiny as a child, right? So I don't think there's any guilt associated with your genetics, especially in my case, because this was a totally unknown thing, totally not showing up in anyone's bloodline. But even if it does, I, I just don't think you should feel guilty about your child having any sort of disability. I don't think you I, I think parents that feel this guilt may not be realizing that your kid is just trying to learn about the world around them. They, they only see you as the vessel and the caregiver and the thing that loves them so much that any sort of idea that you did this to them, it doesn't even enter into a child's mind, I, I don't think. It certainly never went into mine. You know, you deal with kind of questions of how this happened as an adult, but guilt never comes into it, even as a reasoned and justice obsessed 36 year old. I'm justice obsessed. Um, and I think about guilt and, and cause and effect a lot, but that doesn't come into it to me, for me. I would be really, really shocked if most kids with disabilities feel any sort of resentment or even tension with, with parents that have this, they love you, you love them. That's what they know. That's the communication. And I would just implore parents to not like guilt, get in the way of that love to never, ever hold back because you feel this guilt. Guilt is normal. Guilt makes this my, my, my psychologist, my, 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 uh, my uh, therapist has said something to me a few times. It, guilt means you're human. You feel you feel like you have an effect on the world around you. Guilt means you're human, but it doesn't mean it's right. It means your, your humanity is intact, but it doesn't mean you're correct about the way that that actually happens or the way that your child actually feels. So I would just really focus on love because guilt can really block, I think. You know, guilt can really block the way that you can love something. I feel like you can put up barriers doing that. So. I would, I would just I would throw guilt out the window in, in that sense. Um, another question is um, that you had mentioned something about how putting on your shirt may not look like <laughs> everybody else's. Can you kind of expand on that just a little bit, you know, on yeah. how the, you may do something and it's perfectly, uh, sure. I wouldn't say normal for you as we talked about earlier. Right. You, you say that word a lot, but, and how it's okay. 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, you, you develop, um, I, I still, I wonder if I can, I wonder if I have a pin around me. I don't think I do. Oh yeah, I do. You know, I still, I still hold a pin weird. This is how I hold a pin. Now, if someone looked at my hand and was like, oh, I'm sorry, hold a pen. But I can write. Now, my handwriting is terrible, but that has nothing to do with anything. It's just I, I just rush everything. But, but how something looks um, is so secondary to getting it done to me. Um, and sometimes you can't get it done. And that's also okay. There's help and support that goes with those things. And that's totally reasonable. But the acceptance of not being able to do something normally can help with a lot of um, psychological mm, uh, trauma might be a strong word, but psychological difficulty you have getting into things like school. Let's say you have a pool party and you want to take off your shirt to get into the pool. Okay, well, if you can't do that without bending over and kind of pulling it awkwardly over your head, and if you feel weird about that, then you may not participate in the pool party you might feel weird about it you might duck out and say well you know they're gonna see how i take off my shirt it doesn't look like anybody else and so i'm not gonna do it i i kind of feel like eci teaches you early and good therapists especially through childhood and into teenage years can help children develop a sense of fearlessness frankly of just like you know what who cares if this looks weird i can do it and and i think it you know really can help ingratiate your child into, um, into, into public life. And I, that's a pretty important skill uh, to, to develop psychologically, I would say. If, if you're asking about specifics about the shirt thing, let me know. But if, if that's more of what you're asking, then um, that, that would be my answer. I think that's what they were asking. Um, yes. Next question is, how was grade school for you? Uh, grade school is fine. I think, um, uh, you know, I would sometimes leave class or, or not attend gym class to do certain uh, therapies. I would, you know, go to a, a physical therapist instead of, um, instead of gym class, because, you know, what was I going to do in gym class? Um, <laughs> and uh, speech therapy, things like that. Um, I, I, I either very slowly developed my awareness of how others perceived me or folks were pretty cool. Um, I think, you know, I had a, a good school system. Um, I think I was lucky, lucky in a lot of those ways uh, to have a public school system in, in Plano. It's one of the best in the country. If you go just a little bit south, those school systems are really different. They're underfunded. There's a different situation. So everyone's situation is really different. But I did have a lot of support in, um, in Plano for those things. Kids were fine. I don't really remember any sort of uh, bullying or weirdness, uh, at least outside of like the normal, just kids being uh, just the worst sometimes. <laughs> um, but like, it wasn't anything specific to any of my disabilities that I recall. Um, but, you know, th there were accommodations that had to be made, you know, at, at a very early age, you know, before I turned maybe six or seven, I still needed help uh, undoing his, my, my zipper on my pants because I couldn't grip properly. That developed over the course of a couple of years between like six and eight. So then that stopped. So it's just, it's milestones. You know, you, you, you go through grade school, you hit some milestones, you gain a little more independence. I don't really, I don't remember ever having kind of a bad time. I know that's not everyone's experience, but um, yeah, my, my grade school days were, were honestly pretty um, incident free. Um, and I, I, I can attribute that to a good school system and a good support system, but I can, I can probably attribute a lot of that to, to ECI and therapies as well. Okay. Um, I don't seem to have any other questions at this time. Do you have any closing remarks? Um, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, if you, if, if, if you have a child that has, um, you know, any sort of development, developmental delays or disabilities and you're at, at any sort of level, um, I would not hesitate to get involved with an ECI program and the Warren Center is a great one. Um, 
and just know that like there are support and resources out there for you. I'm available uh, to folks. My email is right there on the screen. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, I just want to thank everyone for their time. I think this is like a really important uh, subject near and dear to, to our hearts, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope, I hope I hope I helped uh, some folks today. So I think uh, in the chat that um, we de you definitely touched some people and I know it was an incredible session for me. Um, I cried a few times, but I have a tendency <laughs> to do that. Um, and I just want to thank you for being a shining example of what we're all about and sure. be willing to give back. Um, and I greatly appreciate that. And I just wanted to say thank you again so much for um, sharing your life story with us. Of course, of course. Thank you so much, Amy. Thanks.